welcome to the fourth video in Unit 5. We'll be discussing some specific kinds of snack reactions that don't really fit the general snack pattern that we've developed over the first few videos in this unit. To get started, I want to focus on how we would synthesize acid chlorides. And it turns out that we do this from carboxylic acids themselves. That seems like something that shouldn't work, right? We know that these compounds are below acid chlorides on our reactivity ladder, but the reagent that we use isn't exactly Cl-, so we're not doing a snack reaction directly via the addition elimination mechanism. Uh, we use thionyl chloride, or SOCl2, or you could call it SOCl2, um, to get around some of these issues with reversibility and unfavorability of snack reactions. In part, that's because this reaction also generates HCl and SO2, both of which are gases. And what ends up happening is, even though this reaction may be unfavorable, these two materials will actually leave the reaction flask as the reaction is happening. So essentially, we make a little bit of this, we get these gases, and they leave. But if these compounds, if these compounds disappear, the reaction can't go backwards. And so we end up essentially trapping this acid chloride because of the, our ability to make the reverse reaction un, infeasible, essentially, unless we were to run this in like a sealed container, which sounds pretty dangerous, actually. Uh, this is an example of Le Chatelier's principle where we're effectively removing a product in order to drive an unfavorable equilibrium in the direction that we want. So it's a pretty reliable method. Um, it's kind of a gross reaction to run. If you do this, you've got gaseous HCl that's coming out of your flask. So anything metal that's nearby, maybe those monkey bars in the back of your fume hood, for instance, those are going to corrode really quickly. Um, but yeah, this is a good technique to make acid chloride. So let's look at a couple of specific examples. Right? So you can see the structural change in real molecules. We'll look at... This compound here, this is cinnamic acid. And if we react this with SOCl2, then we're going to end up just changing the OH group for a Cl. Everything else in the structure stays the same. So that means the benzene ring and the alkene are unchanged. We're essentially just substituting the OH group for the Cl group. We could imagine other types of cases as well. Take a different carboxylic acid that looks like this, treat it with SOCl2, and the only change we would expect to see is exchange of the OH group of the carboxylic acid into the chlorine of the acid chloride functional group. So this is a really handy method to get to a highly reactive um, carboxylic acid derivative. If we wanted to get to the very top of that reactivity ladder so that we could make like other kinds of carboxylic acid derivatives, so maybe if we were initially uh, interested in making an ester, for instance, one way we could do it, we'll learn others, is convert a carboxylic acid into an acid chloride and then using the acid chloride to do some kind of a snack reaction. I'd like to illustrate how we could use carboxylic acids in this, what's called a multi-step synthesis. So the idea is that maybe we're trying to make a specific compound, let's say this ester here, and we would need to actually do multiple reactions in sequence to end up getting here from something that we could buy or make using known chemistry. Oftentimes it's easiest to plan these going backwards. This is sometimes called retrosynthetic analysis. What we would focus on probably is functional groups. That's going to be one of the strategies you can use to plan a synthesis. So I know that I'm making an ester, and in particular, what I, what I know how to do at this point is make this bond. Because I know I can make that using a snack reaction. But I know that I'm also going to need to have a compound that goes here as essentially the reactant to make this ester. It needs to be higher on my reactivity ladder for that snack reaction to actually work properly. So this is one of the things that's really valuable about acid chlorides is I know that since they're at the top of the ladder, Anytime I'm identifying these carboxylic acid derivatives, I can always make them using an acid chloride. I don't have to worry as much about this reversibility issue. So what I'm basically saying is that I could make the desired ester from this acid chloride. And I know now that the reagent I would use to go from here to here, for instance, would be OET minus. So I've got my nucleophilic piece. That's going to do the displacement or the substitution for the chlorine. This is looking good. But then the next question is, well, where would this come from? Right? Maybe I can't buy it. 
So here is where our use of SOCL2 as thionyl chloride is really helpful. We know that we can actually start from the carboxylic acid directly. And it looks like this. So this would be an overall synthetic plan. In the first step of the synthesis, I would go from a carboxylic acid to an acid chloride. So that basically I'm using the special properties of SOCl2 to go to the top of that reactivity ladder, and then I can come back down to the ester that I want to make. So this is one of the ways you would think about using acid chlorides. You're, you're generating a very powerful electrophile that we can use to make other kinds of carboxylic acid derivatives. The other thing that I wanted to point out here is the nature of our nucleophile, OET minus. Where would this come from? You can't necessarily just make anions. They typically get made from other kinds of compounds. Um, so let's talk about the nature of the nucleophile in the second step. So just as a reminder, we're talking about OET minus. We know that this is a strong nucleophile. We've developed quite a bit of electron density on our oxygen, and there's no way to remove that electron density via induction or resonance. Our ethyl group is just kind of a dead end there. So we know that this is a powerful nucleophile. I'm not even sure if I need a powerful nucleophile, though. If I've got such a good electrophile, maybe I could get away with something that's a little bit, uh, well, one, less expensive or easier to access, but two, is also a little bit less reactive. We could think about reaction rates as kind of like filling up a bucket. Uh, we don't necessarily need them to be blazing fast. We need them to be fast enough. So maybe if it's like a reaction's done in an hour, that's perfect for humans. That's like a beer break. I don't want it to be too quick. I want to be able to leave the lab. On the other hand, I don't want to be waiting around for months, right? So there's this kind of bar we have to clear. And the idea is that you can think about reactivity in terms of both the electrophile and the nucleophile contributing. If you've got like a really powerful electrophile, a really good electrophile, even like a weak nucleophile could react with a reasonable amount of, of a rate because most of that overall reactivity that you're trying to access is coming from the electrophile. Alternatively, you could look at something that's like not a good electrophile, but you have a fantastic nucleophile, and you might get to the same place, right? It's mostly the nucleophile that's driving right then, or you could have like a nice matching of the two, like a reasonable electrophile or a reasonable nucleophile, and then maybe you can actually get the reaction to work properly that way. What we want to avoid are situations where we've got like a bad nucleophile and a bad electrophile. Those rates are going to be poor. Well, this is a situation where by virtue of how I've planned the synthesis, I've already decided I'm using an excellent electrophile. And that means I don't need this powerful nucleophile anymore. I can use something weaker. That would basically mean putting less electron density on oxygen. And the compound that sticks out to me as easiest to access, it's going to be related to that, is the conjugate acid of this nucleophile. So we can think about our alcohol oxygen as nucleophilic. So our alcohol is nucleophilic at oxygen. It's less nucleophilic than O minus, but that might not matter. So let's look at this um, alternative second step then. We've got our acid chloride. And we're going to react this with our ethanol. Got lone pairs, so I know I'm nucleophilic at some level, and that should give the desired ester. Works fine. You could do this reaction, it would be very fast. Um, and it also turns out to be quite favorable because we're going from, let's say, an acid chloride, so a more electrophilic carbonyl, to an ester, a less electrophilic one. But there's one thing I do notice here we haven't talked about yet, and that's that this alcohol is a is a polar, or sorry, a protic neutral. Nucleophile. And that tells me something about the, what's going to happen to this hydrogen. Specifically, it's going to end up getting transferred to the leaving group, which is Cl. So it sounds to me like the other product in this snack reaction is actually going to be HCl. Which, well, maybe that's not a problem, except for from a safety perspective, right? Your mixture is going to become extremely acidic as the reaction goes forward. It also could be the case that you've got other functional groups in the molecule that you're reacting, either as in the product or in the reactants themselves that react with HCl, which could also be an issue. So we have, on the one hand, an easier to access, less expensive nucleophile, something like ethanol, rather than OET minus. 
But on the other hand, if we use this polar protic, no, neutral protic nucleophile, we end up creating byproducts that are hazardous to us or potentially the compounds that we're working with. To get around this, we're going to add what's called an auxiliary base. So we'll solve the problem of generating HCl by adding a base. I want to be clear that adding this base does nothing for the reaction until the HCl is generated. It's only there to react with the HCl after the snack reaction. We typically use a couple of different bases for this. One of them is called triethylamine, so three ethyl groups attached to a nitrogen. The other is pyridine, which it looks like a benzene ring, where one of your vertices is a nitrogen. So we see that in both cases, we've got a nitrogen with a lone pair, and that's going to be the site of basicity. So normally, the way we would run this reaction is using our acid chloride and alcohol, for instance, and then also one of these bases. For the purposes of this class, you can treat them as identical to each other. So the reaction would overall look like this. We've got two different reagents that we're mixing with our acid chloride. One is our nucleophile, and one is the base, which is there to destroy the HCl. So just to be clear, if this is how we were going to run the reaction, we would actually end up with the conjugate acid of this triethylamine at the end of the process. So that would be 10 ammonium ion and Cl minus. So our revised reaction, where we've actually used the strategy of an, what's called an auxiliary base, so something that we're adding, would involve these two reactants along with the acid chloride. And then the two products you would isolate at the end of the day would be the desired ester, and the byproduct would not be HCl, but actually the conjugate acid of the base you tossed in. This works for other kinds of um, neutral protic. There we go, got it. Nucleophiles like amines, and it's actually even more important in those cases. We'll talk a little bit about that later on in the, in the semester. So just be aware that when you actually see nucleophiles like these neutral protic species, alcohols and amines are very common, um, and you see some kind of compound like pyridine or triethylamine, now you know what's going on. It's not like it's magic. This is not a catalyst. We'll talk about use of uses of catalysts and snack reactions in the next video. It's there for a pretty mundane reason, something that wouldn't be really relevant to you if all you're doing is writing products and boxes on homework, but would be very relevant to you if you were in lab watching a bunch of HCl escaping your flask, wondering if you're going to dissolve yourself. So there's one other way that we can solve this kind of problem one of, of the nucleophile structure. Remember, we, we want to use something like OE2 minus. For instance, one option is to use a less nucleophilic variant, like an alcohol, along with some kind of auxiliary base. But you could also think about situations where you really truly do need the excess nucleophilicity of something like OET minus, so a O minus type of species. So in the next section of this video, we'll actually look at how we would generate what are called alkoxides, these kinds of O minus species, or other kinds of nucleophiles that are negatively charged. Another issue we can encounter with snack reactions is when we run processes like this, where we have kind of a, a medium reactivity carbonyl, in this case a thioester, and we try to use nucleophiles that are easily accessible, maybe we can buy them at the chemistry store, um, like cyclohexanol, and then I know how to deal with this, I'll use my auxiliary base triethylamine. This reaction is actually favorable, but the issue is that it's extremely slow. Just a reminder that favorable doesn't mean fast or slow. It means where will equilibrium be? It could take you know, multiple lifetimes to get to equilibrium. And that's a problem that we would encounter here. So part of the issue is that our electrophile is only OK. Not great, only OK. And we're using a relatively weak nucleophile. It's just not going to get us there. Triethylamine is not going to help. It would only be there to, re to remove highly acidic byproducts. It really wouldn't even be necessary in this reaction, really only for things like acid chlorides or maybe anhydrides. Um, instead, what we would want to focus on is maybe we could convert this alcohol into a better nucleophile by like deprotonating it.
So our goal is to make our alcohol more nucleophilic. And we do that by turning it into an oxygen that's more electron rich, localizing a third lone pair on oxygen. We need a base to do that. And we know that the pKa of this compound is around 15. So at this point, we can make some predictions about what kinds of bases might be appropriate to remove this proton and generate this kind of a species. I need a base with a conjugate acid, we'll fill in the structure in a minute, that has a pKa that's higher than this, right, for this reaction to go forward. And ideally, we want our conjugate acid pKa to be much higher than 15, so the reaction goes way far to the right and all of our alcohol gets depressed. To do this, we often use a compound called sodium hydride, or NaH, or Na, in which case our conjugate acid is an exceedingly simple looking structure, it's hydrogen gas. So here our pKa is around 35. This looks perfect. We've got this big difference in pKa's, that means the equilibrium constant for this acid base chemistry should be about 10 to the 20th. And the other thing is that H2 is a gas. So just like we saw with SOCl2, or the synthesis of acid chlorides, for instance, we're actually driving this equilibrium all the way to the right because we're removing product. H2 is leaving the vessel as we go. Uh, this is a very common strategy for pre-forming a nucleophile. So we would use NaH as like a step before actually doing the snack reaction. So we would deprotonate. with Na before snack step. What would that look like in a practical sense? Well, we would change our reaction scheme here a little bit. We know that this is the product we're trying to make. So that part will do the same, but we'll change the order of operations. So we'll start with our alcohol. And the first thing we'll do is add some Na, uh, maybe go for a coffee, come back, all the Na's reacted. At that point, this is what's in the vessel, the conjugate base of our alcohol, and then I'll add my electrophile. So in this case, that would be uh, our thiol ester. So the other thing you'll notice is I'm no longer adding triethylene. To be honest with you, it was never really relevant in the first place. We only, only use these auxiliary bases like triethylamine or pyridine when we use acid chlorides or anhydrides. The other thing that I notice now is that even though what I'm writing on the far left is one of those neutral protic nucleophiles, after this first step, that's not what I have anymore. I have an anionic nucleophile. So here, the byproduct at the end of the day would actually be SME minus, and that would be interacting with the sodium that came from the Na. So this looks more like a classical snack with the step before it. We can do it all in the same vessel, but just separated in time, um, where we're actually generating a better nucleophile via this deprotonation using Na. The other, the other reagent that some people will use here, which is rapidly going out of favor, so you can tell how, how old someone is if they're actually suggesting this, is to use a different base, sodium amid, which is a version of a base we've looked at quite a few times actually in this unit, an H2 minus. Similar idea, and actually similar um, conjugate acid pKa, ammonia's pKa is about 35. Uh, but we like this NaH reagent better because of the fact that this compound leaves as a gas, whereas in the other case we have ammonia left over that can do side reactions. So a couple of strategies for adding bases to alter the ways that snack reactions behave. Now these are very practical considerations, either using things like triethylamine or purine to destroy acidic byproducts, or trying to get snack reactions that you think might be kind of slow, so things involving poor nucleophiles like alcohols, and only okay electrophiles like thioesters or maybe other esters. You can use uh, things like sodium hydride to actually form better nucleophiles before the snack reaction. So we've done three things in this video, all of them inherently practical. One is that we've talked about the synthesis of acid chlorides. 
We've also talked about the use of triethylamine and pyridine. And finally, we've talked about the use of sodium hydride. You'll see all of these things in the practice problems for SL5. So make sure that you understand where they fit into the overall picture here. And especially with respect to sodium hydride and triethylamine, what the purpose of having these bases really even is. So in the final video of the series, we'll be talking about a similar kind of concept of adjusting reactivity in a case where we might have a rate problem, but here we'll be using actual catalysts rather than reagents that we use at the beginning of a reaction to like make something that we would then use.